Welcome in. It is a wonderful, sunny October morning where I am as we head into fall. Uh, today is going to be a little bit different. If you're tuning in, we are doing kind of a random episode. What do I mean by that? Is we are going through 10 uh, vaguely correlated tips, tricks, and um, ideas that we've been thinking through related to practice growth. So whether you're a solo or group practice, you're looking for marketing help, or maybe just some strategic insight on what it means to be a larger group practice and some kind of asynchronous ideas to get into that, we're going to be covering the gambit today. So kind of stick around for this top 10 list. Uh, and we're going to dive in with a really simple one, which is just check your website and the pages that have high traffic for your mobile optimization. What do I mean by that is do they look good on mobile? Do they load well? on mobile? Does the text show up the way that you want? Do your images show up the way that you want and need? Uh, because we visit websites on a daily basis that look great on a computer screen. And I've made this mistake with my own website as I've done web design on a computer screen. You approve changes on a computer screen. You look at it in your desktop as you're doing the big work, but it doesn't look quite as well. It's just not quite as crisp uh, on a mobile application. Atilio, why is mobile so important in 2024? We live in a mobile world. So 60 to even 90% of the traffic, we manage a lot of websites. We manage a lot of ads. 60 to 90% of web traffic, especially traffic that converts and turns into new clients, comes from a, a mobile device. So people are using their, their phones to search. They, they expect quick answers. They expect a, an experience where they get information in a pace that they like and enjoy. They expect to be able to understand if they're in the right place or not. And they expect to commit to a provider, commit to a follow-up, or even just call right away from their mobile device, right? Yeah. Um, the Amazons of the world have spoiled us. Okay, we want fast. We want it now. We want things to flow through quickly. We want to be able to make decisions quickly. We want to be able to audit. The, the decisions we're making by by having reviews or otherwise. Don't get bogged down with that review part just yet, guys. <laughs> Bear with me. Uh, so people want things fast. People want things fast. People want to be able to make decisions quickly and effectively. Uh, the biggest thing you can do is just not stand in someone's way. Like this yeah. is the, the people that were that the people that are looking at our um, at our websites. They're looking for something already. We just need to not get in their way of committing to working with us. Yeah. Two last thoughts on this scope of information. So when someone's on a much smaller screen on their phone, they can't scan or consume as much information visually or text wise all at the same time. So if you're thinking through a web designer or your current content, maybe vet on like how well constructed the mobile side of things, because it will probably translate better into desktop, but not always vice versa. And again, I've made this mistake as I do my own web design stuff. Um, you can make things really big and beautiful, sweeping hero sections and awesome images. And like just some of that stuff does not work as well it on translate. mobile. It doesn't translate. And so just keep in mind, as Atilio said, if 60 to 90% of your traffic, especially if you're doing something like Google ads and that's where the lander page is getting the traffic or whatever, it's just really important that you check in and spend time more on mobile than on desktop. Hit number two, um, we've spoken with hundreds of group practices this year. I actually just came back from two conferences. So beyond our clients, the sales calls that we have to interact with people, and then the hundreds of conversations I just had last week, uh, a couple, couple thoughts. We get to talk to people that are solo practice, that have four clinicians, 12, 18, 50 plus, and each of them talk about their business a little bit different. Um, Atilio, that solo to small group practice, what is their, what do they describe their business situation most often like? How are they feeling about their business? Um, there, there's a, there's 10% of solos that are loving their life. There's 90% of solos that are not loving their life. And um, I'd say maybe the small groups, most of them are confused, overwhelmed, or um, or 
hopeless maybe about their situation. And I think it's because as we're kind of, as you're kind of like looking at this, Josh, you mentioned some cool numbers here on the, like sort of some benchmarks, I'd say some plateaus, some common plateaus for practice owners based on clinician sizes. I think as you, as you sort of reach new plateaus, it's, it's maybe unexpected what you reach there. I think so many of you are maybe just looking to join or start a group because you're looking maybe for more free time or you're looking to still work in mental health because that's what you love. That's what you're educated on. That's what you're, um, that's what you find interesting, but you realize that there's sort of a stark burnout phase uh, that can really get to you. And so group practice often is like, maybe that extra revenue source or the extra level of freedom or your way of maybe expressing your love for the space, but maybe not working in it quite the same way. And so I think no one really tells you that you probably need to be much bigger than you think in order to get where you want to go to actually get the result or the goal that you actually want. So I, it's really funny. We've worked with practices that start really small and we've seen them like we've literally held their hand and walked with them through massive growths to like 70 plus clinicians or more from, from zero, from baby, from baby stage. And the number one thing that, that bogs you down in those situations is just your own ego saying that's not who I am or that's not what I am. And not just kind of going for the bigger bigger size or bigger things that you're managing or holding responsibility over because the truth is we're in a small profit space. We're in a small profit space. So yeah. as, as an example, more. most like software SaaS companies, uh, when they run it, they really expect to have somewhere between like a 45 and upwards of 60% profit margin on every dollar they collect. It's really hard to get more than like a 12 to 25 percent margin um for your group practice especially if you're in network with most providers i talked to a clinician this week their solo practice uh and they had an acquaintance who was selling their small group practice and they were looking at the numbers as they were thinking about acquiring it and they're like i didn't know a business could be living paycheck to paycheck i didn't know a business could be living paycheck to paycheck um because she had a she had a good you know solo practice that was cash flow positive. And that's a lot of times when you have like four to six clinicians, that sometimes happens. Now, when you start to get to eight clinicians, if everyone's full, maybe that eight to 12 range, you're really settled out there. You're really involved in the business personally to manage, to run things. Uh, your, your team is full. You're probably collecting a good amount of cash, probably doing 500,000 to $800,000 a year if you're doing it correctly. It feels good probably. You're, you're like management, isn't crazy in terms of time. Uh, and this sometimes is a nice settling place for some practices that we see. And then once you start getting above like 12 clinicians, depending on the choices you've made for your business and your systems, it starts to get really hard again. Your real estate suddenly costs more. Your overhead is there. You've tried to bring in an intake person or two or an office manager, or like you've sort of tried to make the move, but it's sucking all of your cash again in order to try and buy back some time or freedom. And so it's kind of this weird transition. What happens when we get larger than, you know, 18 to 20 plus clinicians, Atelier? I mean, that's where you start making actually some, some money. I, I think if you're looking at maybe like 10% profit margins, guys, not including your own sessions. I mean, that's where you start seeing maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year pop out of the business um, of just like free revenue, which is like, great. That's the money that you can put in savings and you can pocket some of that. And so it feels like you're actually maybe making some really good progress instead of uh, having to hunt for all of your next meals for all of your sessions. So really that like, really you need to have about 20 clinicians rocking before you can really start taking some good money out of out of the business on a, on a regular basis, yeah. not including like maybe something that you'd spend on taxes or something else. So, uh, keep that in mind. And for many of you, a lot of, a lot of you who are group practice owners, you, you want to either have maybe like a small caseload or just like 
uh, cases when you want, like for very, very specific cases. And so um, most of you want to transition, at least what we've seen, most of you want to transition away from yes. clinical hours uh, or dramatically reduce the amount of clinical sessions that you're taking. And so this is kind of that point where it makes sense where you're starting to just barely have enough money um, to cover all of your personal expenses that maybe you would be making as a full-time therapist and, yeah. um, and really start reducing down those clinical sessions the way that you want. Yeah. Now, as we think about getting to like 30 plus clinicians, I would make the comment that any person I interact with at this level, they have much more of a business that does therapy more than a like therapy practice that is a business. And it's just this like identity shift as a business owner. Often you have some leadership team, you have office managers, maybe you have two or three locations at this point. You've just really transformed this practice that you own and everything really has to run like a business. If it's going to make money and be competent and survive, you probably haven't gotten to this level unless you've made some really distinct choices and your product is therapy. You're making good cash, you probably have some freedom. You have a, a lot of employee problems. So depending on how you experience employee issues, this is probably a major tension point. Um, and, you know, we see at, at each one of these levels, I'd say we probably see drop off one because of complexity and because of satisfaction. I think there are a lot more people in this world that are happy making a couple hundred thousand dollars from their business with 15 to 20 clinicians than like pushing the envelope and really trying to make a ton more than that and scale with team members and other pieces. So there's fewer larger practices, I think because of satisfaction and like what you make as well as complexity of you don't want to deal with employee problems or you haven't figured out how to offload operations or your churn on clinicians is equal to your recruitment efforts and like things start to break down here um, with some of that. Uh, and then what's happening when we're getting above like 50 plus clinicians to the business? What's the experience like? I'd say, I, I think there's two types of people and there's people who take it well and people who don't take it well. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say that the mental health private practice business is a very complex business uh, compared to maybe some other business types out there. So it's pretty straightforward uh, as far as like the skill as an entrepreneur that you need to have in order to get to this level. Um, but what it does lack in maybe uh, the need for skill set, it does make up for in maybe pressures. I mean, this is not something that you were necessarily trained on. If if the ego shift isn't there between one element and the other element, it can be really difficult. And, and Josh, you were talking about satisfaction. Quite frankly, satisfaction is a big problem. Uh, there's a lot of business owners that make it to the 50 plus range, 50 plus clinician range that are just really not satisfied or they position themselves to be the magic vending machine. So everyone comes to them. Uh, maybe they don't have like a chief of staff or like assistant in, in some way to kind of operate or help operate or be a buffer between those elements. Um, maybe you don't have clarity on data or some other things that would make your life feel better, I'll say. Like it's always helpful to have data and be able to use those metrics. And so if you haven't thought through those things or you're not seeking help, it can be a pretty detrimental business, I'd say. We've seen some people really, really not have a good time there or yeah. feel like they're breaking even, like literally breaking even all the time yeah. where they have to throw fuel on a flame to just keep it going. Otherwise they let down a lot of people. And so if, if you haven't quite cracked the code on running the business at that level, uh, it can, it can be pretty traumatic, stressful, like pretty bad. Yeah. So yeah. the other, the other side is you figured it out, you crack the code and you're like scaled out of the business, right? Yeah. The other side of this 50 plus clinician is uh, you operate effectively, you have the right team members, you have right leadership and um, you really are scaled out almost entirely. Yeah. It's it's a pretty, I wouldn't say it's a simple business to scale out of, but it is a business that scaling out of entirely happens maybe earlier in revenue. Like you can yeah. fully scale yourself out of this business quickly as far as revenue goes in terms of some other businesses. Yeah, definitely. 
just some like insight that we have as a result of talking to so many practice owners and kind of the internal dialogue, monologue struggles that we actually confront on a daily basis for different practice sizes. Hey, we're headed into point number three. It's kind of a quick one. Most practice owners um, that we talk to don't set out to build a large practice, especially some of the largest ones we talk to. They're like, honestly, like this wasn't the goal. I had some extra referrals. So I was like, why not hire my first clinician and see where it goes? And then it just kind of snowballs. But the big reflection at almost every practice owner we speak to that ends up being larger, especially if they're around the corner of 15 plus clinicians, almost always say that they don't regret it. They're, they're happier. They have more business infrastructure. They spend more time on the parts of the business that they want to spend time on. They're making the same as much or often more than when they were smaller. And they've just grown through some of the growing pains of, you know, culture or team management or some of those things. And so it's just often surprising that I'd encourage many of you to just actually think through the, oh, I don't want my culture to change, or I don't want that many people. I don't want to be a large practice. And we'll talk about profit um, at the end of what profit means for your business. But I just want to encourage you that some of the best and biggest practice owners that we talked to, it wasn't their intent to build this giant practice but they kept following the rabbit hole of what makes a good business good and what will allow them to deliver great value to their team and their clients. And they grew bigger as a result and they're happier as a result. Yeah. Grow bigger. Yeah. Grow bigger. Number four, Tilio. Selling your practice. Um, so having an exit, like any any good thing maybe needs to come to an end or at least have an option to end. And so some, some practices will close just by fizzling out into nothingness, right? Yeah. Uh, businesses tend to fail over long periods of time. Uh, I think it's like, oh, after five years, 60% of businesses just fail. And so your business may die out, your business may close, uh, or you scale and yeah. you're fully out of the operations or you sell the entity. Uh, yeah. So you have some options. Most businesses do fail. So one of the, one of the big notes is like most, most business owners don't know either how to end their practice or they run through a season that they don't know how to grow through or don't know how to figure out or pivot uh, to effectively manage or grow their practice in a way that makes sense. And um, oftentimes, if you are unable to pivot in a helpful way, you'll 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 close. Like you may close out, um, or if you sell, you're going to sell at a seriously devalued level. And that's just how it goes. That's normal in business. Things happen. Stuff is rough. Um, so the I think the best case scenario would be you grow yourself and. Um, and you either completely scale out and you have a really great management team or you sell as your business has a pretty good upward trajectory. So all things to kind of consider, there is an exit for you. If you want an exit, you just have to plan for it. Yeah. Number five uh, is one that catches a lot of practice owners by surprise, but is often one uh, that needs to be addressed quickly. If you, because you're solo practice or a small group practice, are doing your intake process and or you have an intake team of any size, if you would give your intake process like a C or C minus ranking in terms of quality or function or content or follow through, uh, that might be your number one bottleneck right now. Not marketing, not client churn, not quality of service, not anything else, but you just might have a really broken intake process that is not allowing you to acquire clients at the degree that you want. We could extrapolate this into closed percentages as well, um, but that doesn't always equate. We might be signing clients up uh, consistently, but they could be bouncing after the first session. It's like both a first session and an intake problem for expectation setting. Like there's a lot of things that get wrapped into the, they reached out for service, to your set up securely for session one. And we just see so many practice owners where this is a radiating black hole where they think they're doing a great job. But in reality, it's kind of 
keeping their business from growing because there's so much chaos and lack of follow through here. I'll, I'll add to that. This is your intake process is your single biggest cost maker in your business. This is the single biggest cost maker in your business because all the energy and effort that you've put into marketing, uh, all the energy and effort that you have uh, put into people reaching out to you for the first time, can you can either make or break your practices revenue and profit metrics through your intake process. And if your intake process and your product are not aligned, you can never sign anyone up. Like you, there's a world where you never get new revenue. Now on the flip side of this is your intake process performs efficiently and effectively, and it hits all the buckets for your audience segments that you need. And you're able to sign new clients up from the people who are inquiring. Uh, and you do generate new revenue and you do fill up your clinicians and you are able to pay your clinicians. So there's a world where your intake team actually completely suffocates your practice. Um, and they oftentimes are the noose uh, on the business, on the business or on the, they, they are the thing that creates the bottleneck for your practice. Um, it's a very important function in your business. And it's something that needs to be taken seriously. It needs to be taken very yeah. seriously. Why we one of the reasons why we offer the HIPAA compliant CRM to provide support, tracking, insight, um, uh, intake turnover is a really huge issue as well. So if you're constantly losing your main intake person or two every six to twelve months, so many reasons why that could be happening. But often, like poor management or poor expectations on the work they should be doing every day, no one wants to live in chaos. Uh, and that can result in people leaving sooner than they want to. But that kind of leads us into number six. Uh, well, number seven in a second. Number six, uh, as we think through it, is often if you're doing a smaller budget, your ads are actually costing you more. If you're doing a smaller budget, long term, your ads are costing you more. What do we mean by that? If you go to an all you can eat buffet and you get a really tiny little small plate, you're paying the premium to eat as much food as you want. So if you eat just a little bit of food, you're not really securing the full volume of value that's there. So if you're spending five or 10 hours a week launching paid ads, or you're paying a, um, a service provider to launch ads for you, a lot of the work is the same. Yeah, as you scale budgets or you try and do more, there's more time involved to some degree. But uh, if you spend $500 a month on ads or you spend $700 a month on ads, it takes about the same amount of time, but you're not paying more for that extra $200 that you're spending. You're just probably getting more leads from it. So just keep in mind, it's not a perfect solution. There's times where we don't recommend you just throttle budget because you might end up spending more than you want before the ads are working. But when you're paying someone to do work and the work isn't always incremental to the volume. So like testing with a hundred or $200 budget often it makes everything harder or more expensive in the short term. Yeah, this is, uh, I think the biggest cost, the hidden cost for small budgets is stability. So unfortunately, the way that I like to do things, you start small to kind of like prove, like test and prove the concept of the system. And then once the system's concept is proven, then you can grow up the budget. But um, we do that so that you don't just throw your, throw gasoline on the fire that's not burning anything helpful. So, yeah. you know, you, you start small and then you grow big as fast as possible. It should be a priority. It's a big, it's a big element to scale your practice from. Like you can just keep dialing up what's working and doesn't cost much extra, like Josh was saying, doesn't cost much extra, but it delivers more stability. It delivers more results in a shorter period of time. It maximizes, like let's say you have a full-time intake person, it maxes their time out. So like that way they're not just sitting on their phone doing nothing for 30 minute blocks uh, every 30 minutes <laughs> throughout your day. So keep that in mind. You wanna be able to max out your you want to max out the flow through from your processes and from the resources that you're spending. So get a proof of concept, make sure that the system works and then scale up and you should scale up quick. Yeah. 
Uh, if you see a sudden drop in referrals compared to a previous month or a previous season that was always there, uh, a couple of things might be happening. And we see this often. It's like, hey, I used to get so many leads and now I don't. Uh, there is a good reason typically. Uh, maybe old networking has finally faded off. Uh, maybe a new practice opened up or someone else is running ads or new search engine optimization in your area and has overtaken you. Um, something broke like a website button or a form fill or you have a 404 page that you don't know about. Um, I've had that happen to me. Um, you've made a small change that actually has a huge impact. You've changed your domain name. You've updated zip codes on your psychology today. You dropped one payer, uh, you, you don't accept Aetna anymore and you took it off your website in psychology today or whatever else. And suddenly it like has this ripple effect. Um, two things, if, if suddenly you see a huge drop in referrals and you like came back this fall and it didn't magically pick up, unless you can find the direct fix for it, it's probably not gonna magically take care of itself. And that's the lesson I want to communicate here is often we see a practice owner being like, well, I used to get so many referrals. Maybe I'll see if it picks back up. But I think of the Cars movie of Route 66 and the, someone put a highway through and slowly the traffic just trickled off. And um, I've got a three-year-old at home. So that's playing and repeat in my head. And the process there sometimes happens with practices as well. Is your referral sources just slowly trickle off and you're just, dead because you didn't take any action out of that to generate new referral sources, new community partnerships, or whatever else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't expect something to change if you don't change it. <laughs> I think it's maybe a great summary. Good <laughs> yeah. summary. Um point number eight, if you've never run ads before or done SEO or some other some of these other marketing elements like today, maybe expect to lose money in the short term and gain in the long term right? There's almost never like a silver bullet situation. Um, as much as we want to just like get lucky the first time, every time guys, we, we run very similar things. Like we have a template, we have a repertoire of things that we know work. Um, uh, and, and we can launch something. We have a very good understanding that it will work. And sometimes it doesn't work. And that's why you have to hire experts. And that's why you work with people who know what they're doing. Uh, because there's a, there's a certain level of, getting something to work, like knowing it will work, letting it run and build momentum. And then it works. And, yeah. uh, and then you have to keep it in line, right? Because it doesn't just always stay perfect. Uh, so keeping things in line, as well as getting them in line at first, it takes energy, but what you're investing in is a system, a system for continued growth and a system for continued business and a system uh, that is reliable and a system that can help you scale up and grow at the levels that you want to scale up and grow. And so creating a return on investment is hard. It's a hard thing. Otherwise everybody would do it. Right. Uh, so I, I think something that something, something that the best practice owners do is have some patience, especially when they know that they're creating a system versus just trying something right. We don't want to, I think the opposite of gambling is marketing, right? You don't want to gamble. You want to take a scientific process, spend on something and continue to improve it until it is no longer gambling, right? Until it is no longer risky is what I should say. And so on the other side of the spectrum is gambling where you're like, Hey, let's just put money down and see what happens. Let's put money down and see what happens. Let's put money down and see what happens. And you just keep gambling. If you do the opposite of gambling, you're marketing probably. So yeah. consider that you're building a system for success and that's how you should gauge success. How is the system coming along? Yeah. Number nine, as we round out some final pieces here today, uh, we just really highly encourage you to talk to other practice owners transparently about their experience and their numbers. Before I talk about what that means, you think of like an employee situation where in a corporate environment, no one talks about how much they're paid and you look left and you look right and someone breaks the silence and you're like, wait, you're getting paid so much more. You're getting paid so much less than me. And like, it's this weird thing that happens if you don't ever talk to your friends about like what they do with their money or what they do with their time or their retirement decisions or whatever. And you just like need people 
just talk openly about what's actually going on in their life sometimes in order to see what's normal. Uh, both at the conferences that I was at, this was happening a lot, but then also inside of our community on one of our calls last week, we were discussing stuff and transparently, you know, a, you know, one of the leaders was just like, okay, all cards on the table. Let's talk about how much everyone's making here. Because someone was like, I have this goal. Is that even possible? And practice owners of all shapes and sizes, those not making any money yet from their practice, and those making close to a million dollars a year of like profit in their bank account on an annual basis, share. And it was, you know, transformative, especially for some of those smaller practices of like, oh, I can run a good business that impacts my employees and my life and so forth with higher revenue or higher profit or reach my goals or know what's possible. And so we do that a lot inside of our own community, our own calls, just talk about that experience so you can learn from it. But if you don't have that, uh, still pursue that with other practice owners at conferences or local meetups, talk about it more. Yeah, I like that. What's possible? What's possible? Uh, I think the last point is just caring about profits is one of the most important thing you can do. So it sounds selfish sometimes, or it sounds greedy, or it sounds whatever it is. Uh, I want you to suspend disbelief for for a little bit here. Uh, profits are where all the fun things happen. Profits are, uh, it's money that is not used, which uh, could be used for something. So money is a tool in this case. And profits is where you get all your extra tools and resources to be able to fund whatever it is that you want to fund, whatever it is that you think is important to fund. So there's there's a there, there's a lot of good people in the world and there's a lot of bad people in the world. And I think profits is uh, one way to cast your vote. So many of you are helpers. So I'd rather maybe have profits in your hands than some other people's hands. And so I think just... I think having a mindset about profits where it is a resource that you can impact or inflict change in a helpful direction, I think is always something that you should stand behind and you should attempt to create for yourself and for your practice. Uh, it's the lifeblood uh, to creating freedom, among other things. Yeah. To use an example... Of a, of a larger practice. If you have a $5 million in revenue therapy practice and you have 5% more profit across the board, uh, across the board, that's what, $250,000 in additional annual profit that's coming in. There's so many things you can do with that in terms of your building your staff pay, hiring extra support for you actually. Yeah, this might diminish long-term profit. Um, facilities, quality of care, um, uh, nonprofit work, if you want to form a foundation and funnel stuff through there for community impact. Um, take home, talk to a practice owner like, hey, I want to donate you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to this organization that I care about. And I can't do that yet without more profit. There's so many things you can do if you run your business in a ethical, substantially well, precise and focused way with good profit. And so I think often the scale, the mindset, the issues around profit, you don't want to push into because of kind of all the problems we sometimes see with it, but there's all the solutions you get to provide. And we've talked about this on previous ones, but the world needs more business owners that make money in great ways. So that way you can provide that leadership and those opportunities to other people. We want you to be able to provide opportunities and leadership to other people with the profit you successfully get from running a great therapy practice. If you need help with that, we're here. Reach out to us, go to mytherapyflow.com. We can help with the marketing and with the scaling of your practice. We've got a great team to support you uh, every step of the way. We'll see you guys next time.